guys, welcome to Telling the Told and Untold. My name is Tsuru. As we all know, August is Women's Month, so I have decided to cover gender-based violence cases. So if there are any specific cases you would like me to cover, please leave them down in the comments, or you can jot it down in the case suggestion link that I have in the description box. Balesa Madiba was born on the 7th of November 1992 in Deep Bluff and people described her as someone who had such a beautiful smile and it was one of the first things that you would notice about her. She was one of nine kids and she had six sisters and two brothers. The family then decided to relocate to the Free State and this is where Balesa attended Boshoff Primary School and then went on to Boshoff Wood School where she completed her matric in 2010. And throughout her entire schooling career she played both volleyball and netball. Her father was a businessman and many people think she took after him. He'd always tell her that she should go into business, study accounting and become really successful and just have a lot of money. But unfortunately in 2006 he did pass away and the entire family was completely heartbroken. After finishing high school, Balesa decided to move back to Deep Bluff and she moved in with her grandmother and then she got accepted at the University of Johannesburg and studied towards a Bachelor of Commerce degree majoring in accounting. Her studies were going really well and she really enjoyed campus life. She worked at Student Village during her first and second year, which is a student accommodation. And she was further described as someone who was really dedicated to her studies. She was loving, caring and very passionate. Alyssa had a friend, her name was Matidi Somakwarazi, but most people refer to her as TD, so for the rest of this video I'll also be referring to her as TD. In total there were a group of three, but the two of them were really close, their families knew one another, and during school holidays Balissa would go to TD's house, and sometimes TD would go to Balissa's house. Some people described TD as someone who was very street smart, more than Balissa was, but they both had like huge impacts on each other's lives. The 9th of August 2013 was Women's Day and in this specific year it fell on a Friday. Balissa had plans to go to TD's house later that evening because it was either one of TD's younger brothers or younger sister's birthday parties and they had invited her. But in the morning her brother, his name was Tabiso, they were extremely close. He wanted to take Balissa out alongside his five other sisters and their mother just to appreciate them as women and this is what they did and they had a really good breakfast and just enjoyed each other's company. Balissa wanted Tabiso to come with her to Tidi's house but he had other plans but he did but he then insisted on taking her to Tidi's house and just dropping her off but she told him that it was fine you know she didn't want to delay him and that he should just go along to whatever plans he had that night and he should just drop her off and then she'll catch a cab straight to Tidi's house and it wasn't a problem and this is what he did and unfortunately it was the last time he would ever see Tidi alive. The next day one of Balissa's sisters, her name was Debuho, they were extremely close, they both went to the same primary school, same high school, same university. She tried calling Balissa but Balissa didn't answer and she thought it was a bit strange but she thought nothing of it and then Sunday came and her other family members tried getting a hold of her but Balissa wasn't answering her phone and they all thought it was a bit strange because Balissa was usually really good at communicating with them just letting them know about her day or what her plans were or like where she was but this time she wasn't answering the phone and this is when panic started setting in Monday the 12th of August it turned out that Balissa was still at TD's house Different sources say different things, but it is believed that TD left the house around 5 a.m. or half past six, and then her grandmother also left. TD lived on a property with her grandmother alongside her uncle, his name was Dumisane, as well as tenants that rented out the back room. I'm not too sure if Dumisane was the tenant that rented out the back room, but those are the people that lived on the Mapanazi property. So according to TD, she left in the morning, then her grandmother left and they told Balissa to drop the keys off at the back room when she left because she had classes that morning and she had classes at DJ but it was this way to campus. So they left Balissa there and then they left and then once TD got to work that morning, she tried to call Balissa but Balissa didn't answer the phone and she just tried to call her just to let her know that she got to work safely and was checking if Balissa also got to school safely. 
That same day, TD decided to call Deboho, one of Balissa's sisters, to ask if she knew where Balissa was, and she told her that they didn't know where Balissa was, they couldn't get a hold of her, and her phone was off. After this, one of Balissa's aunts decided that they should go to the police station because the things that TD was saying like wasn't making sense. So they wanted to go to the police station and just try and see if they could help them, but apparently the person that takes the report for missing persons wasn't there, and they also didn't allow them to open a missing persons report for Balisa. And then they then decided that they wanted to go to TD's house because obviously this is where Balisa was last seen. And they tried to convince the police officers to go with them, they didn't want to go alone, it took a bit of convincing, but eventually they said they would go with them and they went with two police officers to TD's home. And once they got there, it was TD's grandmother, TD and Dumisani, the uncle that lived on the property with them. So as the family was asking TD and Dumisani like questions, like their questions would be directed to TD, but Dumisani would like stop her, cover her mouth, interrupt her, and then he would answer, even though he was answering questions that he probably like didn't know the answer to, and the family thought it was very strange. And uh, Tabi saw Balisa's brother, remembers it was the first time that he saw Dumisani, like he didn't know who Dumisani was, and his character was just very suspicious that day. And then police also discovered that he was the last one to see Balisa, because according to him, Balisa was walking out uh, the property whilst he was busy in the yard. Police officers then decided to open up a missing persons report for Balisa that day, and soon the media caught with that she was missing. And they started reporting about this UJ student that was missing and how she was last seen at her friend's house. And because the media was reporting about Balissa's disappearance, the police felt like more obligated to solve the case. They had this added pressure because now everyone knew about Balissa's disappearance and they felt like they had no choice but to solve it, which was like a really good push for them. And Balissa's friends and you know like family members, some from high school, even some from university, they would go to Balissa's family home, you know, just to show their respects and show the family that they were there supporting them and that they also wanted Balissa home. But it was also strange because TD wasn't giving the family like that same thing. She was like she didn't call to check up on them and she was just very distant and they thought that was a bit strange considering how close her and Balissa were. Police officers then decided to track down Balissa's phone and they saw that at first it was in Soweto Pire which was where TD's home was and then from there it moved to Orlando which is still in Soweto and then ended up in Johannesburg CBD and they managed to track it down to a specific pawn shop and they found that someone had sold the phone to the person in the pawn shop and he didn't know who it was and after investigating and looking into him some more they concluded that he had nothing to do with Ballester's disappearance and he was just like someone that was just there you know like someone just sold him the phone but he had no connection to them. Police had no leads and then they decided to go search the Makwanazi property. They would go with their dogs but unfortunately their dogs didn't find anything but it wasn't like a one-time thing. I think maybe they went twice or three times but then the Makwanazis then decided to apply for a court interdict which basically restricted the police from entering their home and this is just because they felt very irritated and harassed by the police because they would constantly be in their home like on their property searching for something the police didn't even know what and they also felt very embarrassed because police would constantly go there with dogs you know all these police vans and they felt like their community members like like we're just looking at them like their neighbors and judging them so they were just like very embarrassed felt harassed irritated and they were just like enough is enough and after this court interdict police officers were not allowed to search their property Two weeks after Balissa went missing, all leads went cold and at this point police officers didn't think that Balissa was still alive. Weeks turned into months and Balissa was still missing and her family was just very confused and lost and they had feelings of guilt, you know, that they couldn't find her, that they couldn't bring her home. The brother that she was really close to, Tamiso, he's the one that took the lead, he was the family's representative, he would like 
do a ton of research he would organize searches his phone number was also out there so if someone thought they had seen Balisa they would call him you know at all times of the day at night he would stop whatever he was doing and go where they thought they had seen Balisa and he would search and every time he came home empty-handed and without Balisa eventually police then decided to close Balisa's case because they felt as though they had no evidence they had no leads they had no persons of interest and they felt like there was nothing that they could do they then decided to pass on the docket to another police officer and this and this investigating officer gave Balisa's family the hope that they kind of felt like they had lost because he told them that he had done this so many times before he had always been successful and he told them that he would bring Balisa home. For cases like Balisa where there is no evidence, like no clues, no persons of interest, sometimes what police officers need is an informant, just someone to give them an anonymous tip and this is exactly what happened in Balisa's case. More than two years after she was reported missing, they received an anonymous phone call that they should go to the Makwanazi's property, they should go to the back room and once they got to the back room they would see a washing line and under the washing line they would see that the soil is kind of caved in and this is where they should dig and where they would find Balisa's remains. Then on the 16th of November 2015, police officers went to the Makwanazi home to search for Balisa's remains. Again, the media caught whiff of this and they started reporting about this and they were saying that police officers were searching for Balisa's remains exactly where she was last seen at her friend's TD's home. Her family got phone calls from like their other family members, some of their friends, asking them if they had seen the news and that police officers were at TD's home searching for Balisa's remains and then the family went there and not too long after that police officers did discover skeletal remains and although the body was so decomposed that they couldn't identify who it was in that moment it was almost like unanimous that everyone thought that the skeletal remains did belong to Balisa the body was then taken away and DNA evidence confirmed what everyone already knew and that was that they had finally found Balisa. It was discovered that it was unlikely that Balisa's remains had been moved from one place to the Makwanazi's home based on how the skeletal remains looked and also by the soil that they had found where she had been buried. It was also discovered that shortly after the disappearance, renovations had been done at the Makwanazi's home. In particular, they had fixed Dumitsani's door handle because it had been broken. Somehow, they managed to find the person that had done this work on Dumitsani's door and they just asked him a couple of questions and he told them that when he went there, he noticed that they had done tiling lock on the floor and he was upset because he was the one that would usually do the work at the Makwanazi's home. So for him, he thought they they had kind of like cheated on him and went to someone else to do this tiling work. So he asked Dumisani about it and Dumisani told him that no, he had done it himself. And exactly where he did this tiling work is where Balisa was buried. In the Piri community, Dumisani was feared. Everyone was scared of him. And it's also said like when he looked at you, he just made you feel very uncomfortable, unsafe. If you were a woman, he would look at you and just undress you with your eyes, you know, and you just wouldn't want to be around him. He was known as Matri, and this is because he would carry three firearms with him at any given time. And apparently he had literally killed someone in in broad daylight they were at a tavern they were drinking this person upset him so he went straight to him took out his gun and shot him point blank in the head like there were witnesses everything but somehow he was acquitted of this murder and he was just out and free roaming the streets on the 24th of January 2016, Balisa Madiba's remains were returned to her family and they were finally able to lay her to rest. Police officers then continued their investigation, trying to gather more information. And this is when someone within Dumisana's circle decided to give police the information they so desperately needed. Apparently sometime in 2015, they, were, they went to Clip Town for a couple of drinks. 
and Dumi Sana was dancing with this girl but she got tired and she said that she was going to the car because she wanted to sleep and Dumi Sana got really upset by this because for him like she belonged to him she had no right to want to go to sleep and he was still busy dancing with her so he went to one of his friends and he whispered in his ear that she can't go to bed because if she does I'll crush her skull just like I did to Balissa's and true enough, when they looked at the autopsy report, Balissa's skull had been crushed. This is when they decided that they were going to arrest Dumisani Makwanazi for Balissa Madiba's murder. But it was quite challenging because at this point in time, the investigating officer's life was at risk. It seemed as though someone within, like the precinct, was giving Dumisani updates about his case, telling them what like police officers had, the information they were able to gather. So the investigating officer, like he couldn't go certain places, he couldn't meet up with the media, he constantly had to look behind his back. And at some point, someone had literally tried to break into his office to steal Balissa's docket. And because his life was so at risk, he wasn't he didn't want to be the one to arrest Dumisane. So um, he had been going to court because he had recently been arrested for having an unlicensed firearm. So he got some other, he got some other police officers who dressed in like civilian civilian clothes and an unmarked car. So once Dumisani went out of court after like his trial, they would catch him off guard and arrest him. And they finally managed to do this. When the trial first started, it seemed as though Dumisan was very quiet and reserved, but soon he started swearing at the media. He would like give them the middle finger. They also discovered that Dumisane had five children with five different women, which just kind of indicated how he just couldn't commit to one person or just how unloyal he was. It is not clear why Dumisani murdered Balissa, but they do believe that on that day, he woke up early to try and get with her. And this probably wasn't the first or second or even like the third time that he made sexual advances towards Balissa. And on that specific day, like she did before, she kind of denied him, said no. And he got really upset by this because he didn't get his way. And in a fit of rage, he murdered her. Tidi and her grandmother Tandi Makwanazi were both questioned by police but they were never criminally charged. Unfortunately, Tidi also passed away in 2019. Finally, on the 26th of February 2021, so just last year, Dumisani Ronald Makwanazi was found guilty and sentenced to 31 years in prison for the murder of Balissa Madiba. <laughs> And that's it for today's video if you guys have any comments please leave them down below don't forget to like subscribe and all that jazz and if you have any videos or specific cases you would like me to cover this month please don't forget to let me know and I'll see you guys next time